Hello everyone, it's Shane Kanto, your Wasteland reviewer, and welcome to Wasteland Talks, my weekly talk show where I talk about whatever the hell I want. And this segment this week, we're doing ranking, and I have three friends on here who all contribute with me at Sif Pop to talk about the top 10 ranked list of all the Planet of the Apes movies, because yes, there's 10 of them. And I'm sure many people only realize that there's the four new ones and maybe the original. But no, there's a lot more than that. And some of them we might want to forget. But we're going to talk about them anyway. But we got Adam, we got Foster, we got Heath. Thank you all for coming on. Thanks for having us. Pleasure. Thank you. That was perfect. You didn't even talk over any of you. So we're going to... To give you a little bit of background on what we did here, our friend Robert couldn't join us for the actual recording, but the five of us gave our rankings of these 10 films, and I used math and figured out a weighted rank list here, which, yes, Foster appreciates, as he also teaches math like me. Um, but we're going to get started with the bottom and work our way to the top. And the winner of the worst in this ranking is the much maligned Tim Burton remake of Planet of the Apes. So I'm going to go around the horn here. So Adam, what are some quick thoughts on Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes movie? Uh, I think I had line of the century in my review. Um, was It's Abraham Lincoln. I think that sums it all up. Um, no, it's just... Um, the focus is all wrong on this one. Um, it's basically... There's no world building. Uh, it's everything feels for a two hour plus movie. It feels rushed. Um, everything feels skipped over. There's no detail. Um, it's basically leading to you. I just you just don't care about the characters or what's happening to them at all. Um, that's how I kind of felt about that. And, and to keep it in a nutshell and keep this. Um, what are we calling this? It's not a podcast, but anyway, keeping it brief. While how I you make it longer. Uh, Mark Wahlberg is Oscar worthy, I would say, just to start. So, fact number one, Razzy. <laughs> um, if you say so, um, I think he's incredible. Very nuanced expressions, <laughs> such as what, huh? <laughs> just to name a couple. Um, I think, uh, <laughs> aside from him, uh, I think the makeup is actually really cool, and I think is the best yes. thing about the movie by far. Um, mm -hmm. and is really neat to see them do like a a full makeup job for the apes which you never really get in the originals it's just like those masks that have makeup within them but it's like you know it's like the 70s um and then of course we have cgi now so i think like for that i don't actually hate this movie and it's not my number 10 it would be my number nine um yeah otherwise it's not that great i will say tim roth paul giamatti uh understood the assignment mm. and are having a lot of fun and i enjoy watching those two Everything else is pretty bad, though. Uh, yeah, no, I concur. This movie sucks. Um, I, it's weird. I have an odd bit of nostalgia for this because I remember seeing this in theaters. And while I agree, I think the best part of the movie is the makeup. Uh, my favorite part is the soundtrack. I love not the soundtrack, the score. I loved Elfman's score here, that main theme that plays in the opening credits. That has been stuck with me for more than 20 years, and I've only seen the movie like three times, like twice within its theatrical window, and then not again until, you know, like a month ago when I rewatched everything. Uh, and for whatever reason, that score still just pops into my head randomly. So that, I think, is genuinely good. The thing that I wanted to address directly, though, is, Adam, it's what you touched on is, that this movie feels incredibly rushed, but it's still like two hours long. And that's because hmm. it completes the original framework of the original film, which is astronauts, they land, captured, they learn about the, the ape culture and society, conflict, and then they escape, and then he leaves. Like, that's the, essentially the framework of the original film. That is all done within the first 45 minutes of this movie. So they're just like rushing through exposition, character development, like at such a high rate so they can get to this spacecraft out in the, the forbidden area to set up this final act action set piece 
that just feels so out of place and it just it just feels like the movie doesn't know what it's doing. It's like someone had an idea of Planet of the Apes. Maybe they saw it once as a kid, mm-hmm. and they're like, "Oh, I can just redo that without actually going back to rewatch it as an adult first before writing the script." That's what it feels like to me. They're like just picking off their memory of what they think should happen instead of actually pacing out a real story. So those are the things that really bother me. Also, I will never understand why they let the humans talk. Uh, I I it, because you let the humans talk. What makes a uh, Wahlberg so special besides just, he's just Marky Mark and you know, he's a good rapper like, but the apes don't know that he didn't let off That's his label skill, you know? So like, you know, what made Charlton Heston so special in the first one is he could talk. He was intelligent. Mm-hmm. Like if all mm-hmm. the humans are talking and intelligent in this world. Okay. So he has different clothes on. Like I've just, I've never understood it. It's literally never addressed in the entire film. And it just kind of destroys the premise of why why Helena Barnum Carter so horned up for him and so interested in him <laughs> in the first place. It's just it. You it felt the so good weird. vibrations. Feel yeah. it. Feel it. She's a humanitarian. <laughs> yeah. So those no, are my just, complaints. <laughs> first off, the ending of this movie tries to one up the ending of the original, but it literally yeah. makes no sense. Like, unless they were going to have some kind of convoluted way of explaining that in a sequel that never happened, like, it just Ooh. felt like, oh my god, I've come home, but there's... It was like, how that happened? Um, it's a and, middle finger to the fan base. Well, and it's like... It was a one of the original ending. That's just iconic. We'll get to that. Um, but I think like, it's just a also- studio. That's, I think it's just a studio trying to cash in. They make something without any forethought strange for Disney to do that they haven't done that with anything else other than everything Star Wars um there's just no plan there's just no plan to this other than to on nostalgia will sell tickets it's simple as that yeah and Mark Wahlberg is no Charlton Heston like (laughs) at this point like Mark Wahlberg's a blank slate like huh um like I'll stop bring up pieces from the original film because we'll certainly get there but like I just feel bad for such a talented rest of the cast who everybody's stuck under all the makeup which is a great score mm. and great makeup can only go so far and yeah this movie does not get the original film this is like we're gonna make an action movie it's just like that's not what Planet of the Apes was about and you take all the depth out of it and I I cannot believe I I really want to know how much money they paid Charlton Heston to show up as Zayas and just quote his quotes from the original film and just be like, wow, <laughs> this is ridiculous. But no, this I mean, was this was a misfire for sure. A very big budgeted one. Unlike our next one, which well, looked like it actually had- real quick, I want to say something before yeah. we go to the next one. It's a misfire in terms of quality. In terms of box office, this movie actually made a killing. They planned on making a sequel that maybe would have explained Abraham Lincoln and that stupid ending. But they ended up not because the backlash from critics and audiences was so severe that they didn't do it. But, like, don't be fooled. This movie made hundreds of millions at the box office. It was a success. Which is is hilarious because that doesn't stop. Like, if you make a marginal profit today it's like sequel yeah like moving forward yeah i'm checking it now this movie domestically made 180 million in 2001 that's domestic not even worldwide so like this movie made a killing ridiculous there are movies today that would kill for that in the fall guy furiosa yeah tears um so this was indeed the bottom of the list with a rate a weighted average of 1.4. And very close with a 1.6 was Battle Play of the Apes, which this was a direct to TV film that ended the original series of films, which going out on a high note with five dollars in your budget. Um we'll go back around. So Heath, what's what are your general thoughts on Battle for the Play of the Apes? Um, this one's just boring, I think is, uh, is a big part of this one. And 
it's been said before it's worth saying again there's almost no greater sin a movie can make than just being boring and forgettable and this one definitely is which is crazy because it's only like 90 minutes long like i think this is easily the shortest one and it's again it's been said before but it just feels cheap it feels like oh we have some leftover apes costumes in the closet let's just bring them out and knock the dust off them and tell a, a real simple story it looks like the whole thing is like filmed on someone's ranch like out <laughs> in the desert like it's it's not it's spawn <laughs> ranch <laughs> like it's just it's just it just feels cheap the 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 story feels flimsy the themes are very lacking which again that's what this franchise is known for is this metaphor and themes and analogies and it's just it, it's just it's boring it's not interesting foster no, I just love the image that it's filmed on someone's ranch. That's exactly it. Exactly <laughs> what it feels like. And like the like, you can completely get past like the masks and everything and all the other movies because they're really good. But then when it's when the movie is really boring like this one, it completely fits mm -hmm. into what you're saying. Um, yeah, this one's just like the other sequels, which we'll get to. Um, each have like a thing about them that makes them really unique and different. And it's part of what makes the franchise so cool is that like each movie is going for something different. Um. Aside from this one, when we get to this one, it's just literally, it's a battle for the planet of the apes. It's very straightforward. It's like the most boring version of that. Um, the one thing I, or two things I do think are good about this, Roddy McDowell I love, um, and he's great, uh, as always. And then the other thing is, I like seeing the different ape factions form, which then you later see in Kingdom as well. Um, and I wish that was more of what was explored here. Like, I think a like a inter-species battle would have been like a civil war for the planet of the apes would have been a lot more interesting than the humans versus apes because it just got like so basic and boring um but there were seeds of cool things here how are you adam um yeah i will agree with everything that's been said before um my my biggest points um maybe different to that is that yeah it, it stops mirror the original first four um, are all great because they mirror society in a different aspect. Every time there's that theme of a different, it's pointing out a different foible in society. This one just doesn't do that at all. Um, and for a movie called Battle of the Apes, where there's no battle at all, that just that just sticks in my craw. Like, what's the point in that? Um, at least War for the Planet, War of, had a war. Um, you just you can't call a movie Battle for the Planet when there is no battle. But other, like, other than that, everything that Ethan Foster said is completely agree with. They had like 15 guys with guns just basically, yeah, no, like you said, on a ranch. Uh, yeah. <laughs> shooting at tree houses. Um, that's basically what this movie was. Which, yeah, this it is boring. This just feels like the worst tendencies of elongating franchises of just like we'll make it for cheap and we'll just watch it on tv anyway um and when you could literally see like the human skin under the masks this time you're just like uh we didn't even try here um those are all like principal some principal characters because like at least in the First Planet of the Apes movie, they went to a lot of lengths for anybody who was up front in camera <clears> and talking to have really, really detailed makeup and everything. This is just like, whatever. And special shout out to, I believe this was the one that's on the TV in Argo, which is what convinces uh, him to go to John Chambers, which is like, well, at least it did something. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll say this as much as i agree that the burton one is worse than this and i had it ranked worse because i think it is a worse film i would rather watch the burton film over this film because at least there's like a campiness like foster was saying to roth's performance and mm. giamatti and like i can appreciate the makeup and mm. that score i was talking about like at least i don't like what they're they executed on but at least it's trying this this movie's not trying anything it's just it's yep. dull no, I, I have this last because this point. just feels so cheap and yeah. low effort. So, like, these two it's were very obviously Bob. Yes. Like, yeah. they received all of the 10th place and 9th place votes from everybody. So that was pretty clear. 
Now, this is where it gets a little, little muddled because the next two were relatively close. And at number eight, we have Beneath the Planet of the Apes, mm -hmm. which honestly is like, I would say the boldest in these movies. Because yeah. Psychic Humans was not on my bingo card. That worship the nuclear too. bombs. <laughs> yes. So, Adam, what are your thoughts on Beneath the Planet of the Apes? I, I don't have many, to be honest. And when did I watch this? If it was last week, then I can't remember much about it. Uh, 21st of May. So, yeah. Um, but just looking at my letterbox review, it's like it's still, at, least, at least it's still holding a mirror up to society. So that's why I rank it a bit higher and basically worth checking out. Um, and kind of as, as was just alluded to, it's very much a product of its time and with cold and hot war and... Um, yeah, it's decent. I don't remember much of the detail, um, like production values and, and whatnot, but just that it wasn't the best and probably forgettable, although still worth checking out, just because it's part of this series. Foster? So, yeah, I agree. It, it is the boldest one. Um, I also still feel like it's pretty boring. <laughs> yes. Like, it's, it's so weird because it is bold, but it's really... Like the first half is just a retread of the original, but worse. And the guy even looks like Charlton Heston too. Because it doesn't have Charlton Heston in it. Yeah. Um, but just not as not as insane. <laughs> um and then the second half uh is certainly more interesting, and I would prefer that um for sure, but it's still just like a head scratcher. It's like I love it in the sense that like this is insane and like um I, li I like the setting like in the St. Patrick's Cathedral that's underground and the nuclear bomb and everything like it looks cool and the ideas are interesting and I appreciate the boldness of like the actual final ending like the last minute. Um, but it's like I don't really enjoy watching it. I'm not like having fun. I'm just like this is crazy, you know, so it's pretty low for me too. How are you Heath? Oh, I'm almost verbatim exactly what Foster said. I actually looked at the runtime and yeah, it's almost exactly like at the two third mark that it finally does the new storyline. Cause Foster's right. The first two thirds of this movie is literally the first movie over again, like the exact same narrative. Just, they gave us a different character and yeah, by the time we start to get something new and it's a, it's a big, big swing. They take a big hack at this, but it's a big swing and a miss. Like they do not connect. And it, it I love the ambition. I love some of the themes it's going for, but it just doesn't work for me. And like Foster said, it's kind of boring. And it's also one of these because I did wait so long for something new to happen. You wait through two thirds of the runtime. By the time something new does happen, I'm just like, you've lost me. Like I'm just not interested in following along anymore. I don't care what happens to these characters. And had they started out or, or gotten to that, like at the beginning of the second act, who knows, this could have been a whole different thing. But like, as it is, I, I appreciate the swing. I like some of the themes that it's going for. I love the religious zealotry angle and all those, this craziness, the idea that some humans have survived and evolved and, and sure. Like the, like Foster said, the, the closing minute decisions that they make here, bold swing, but like, it's just boring it, again, just, just like battle. It, the worst thing you could do is be boring. And this is boring. Most of the runtime. So I have a couple interesting facts because I just read Charlton Heston's autobiography in the arena. So they're like, we need to make a second Apes movie and we need you to be in it. <laughs> and he's like, I will agree to this if you kill me off in the opening scene. And then they negotiated with him and said, how about you get captured in the opening scene and then come back at the end and then they kill you off and he's like sure <laughs> and the, the one requirement was all of his shooting had to be in less than 10 days and they accomplished it I was going to say it certainly feels that way <laughs> Bruce Willie style like glass it's like we have him for like 15 days let's get this done now it's the lead in this is boring. He is a rip off Charlton Heston, and yeah, the first two thirds of this movie is just a rip off of the first movie because they're like, "Well, people love that one," and then yeah, this is crazy. 
And I'm really wondering if they're bold enough to get influence from this for the new one. Because not to spoil the ending of Kingdom of, the Play uh, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, but like what particular detail that happened towards the end, I'm just like, I'm like, are we getting like beneath here? But no, it doesn't seem quite mm. that crazy. But no, all the crazy psychic humans and stuff like that worshipping a nuclear bomb. And the fact that the movie ends with it just being like, and the day a small satellite died. It's just like, this is like the most dour ending possible they blew up Earth. It's just like, holy shit. So, yeah. You would think this killed the franchise. But we'll get there. <laughs> what what an interesting way of uh, rebooting this. But no, crazy. Um, and our next one here, that's honestly only, well, first off, I did want to mention Robert was the only one that had uh, Beneath in his top five. The I was going to say, was... Robert would have been the defender of this if he could have made it for yeah. the episode. I know he loves this movie. And then next up is Escape, which, Heath, I guess you're going to be that one for this one because you had this highest ranked. But Escape, no, I had this at seven. So far, this is exactly my ranking. So I'm fine with all of this. So we have Escape here, which time travel. Um, so, Heath, what are your general thoughts on Escape with Planet of the Apes? Yeah, I, I think this one is... a we're at the point where this is tolerable for me. Um, I, I, I enjoy escape. I don't, it's not like a slog to get through like battle or beneath, or it's not insulting to my intelligence, like the Burton remake. Um, I, I can find enjoyment out of this. Uh, I do uh, have to completely set aside any amount of believability in the beginning of this and how they could possibly time travel and show up in our time even though there was no shot of any kind of construction of a time machine or spaceship going on in beneath, even though we see the world clearly end at the end of beneath. And we're supposed to just believe that, Oh, by the way, they had a time machine being constructed the whole time and they got into it like, you know, Kal-El on Krypton style, like as the <laughs> world is exploding and they, they time travel back and oh, she's pregnant, by the way. Like it's just the they retconned this so hard because they wanted to just clearly keep making apes movies, which is fine because I enjoy the movies. But like as a as a as I generally consider myself a narrative plot first person, this is like an excruciating amount of okay, I have to turn my brain off to get past. But once you do, it's it's kind of fun. Again, they do the fish out of it's the reverse of the original film. That's what this is. If the original film is we have human in an ape world trying to understand ape culture and society this is apes in a human world trying to understand human culture and society and it's interesting seeing them being completely not scared of humans because they don't know to be scared of humans they haven't interacted they don't know what the politics of the world are like in 1970s america and all these things and it even does this weird like pretty woman thing where like she goes out shopping and buying clothes and becomes a social light for a while. It's really bizarre, but where it goes towards the end of the film is actually quite interesting. And I think it's a very bold choice with how they chose to end this. Um, so, you know, I don't think it's perfect. It definitely has its flaws, um, but at least this is trying for something. It's interesting. I, I think the the confrontation when they start investigating and they they do like the, it's not a court hearing. It's like a Congress kind of session where they're talking to the apes and about their journey, but you can see the apes are withholding information. And like, it's both sides kind of playing a chess game with each other throughout the whole film as they learn more information about each other's cultures and societies and what they've been through. Uh, I, there are things that work here. Um, and so, yeah, that's at least why I had it <clears throat> on my personal ranking at seven. Uh, above the other three that we've done so far. Yeah, I just realized that I think I had your name and Foster's names flipped. So, yeah, Foster I think Foster really likes this one. Yeah, has this one a lot higher than everybody else. Yeah, I I flat out love this one. Um, so any sort of 
time travel messiness just doesn't bother me. I genuinely don't even notice it. I don't think about it at all. I'm blessed with being stupid in some <laughs> capacities. Um, I think the best choice this movie makes is uh, making the apes the main characters. They are the most interesting part of the franchise once you get past the first movie at the very least. Um, and I just love uh cornelius and zira i think they're really really lovable um and i think the just the structure of the movie inherently gets you on their side so quickly um and i think uh like their love for each other throughout the movie just feels so strong because they're alone you know um and i also i, I like the commentary throughout all of the movies i mean we've only talked about the bad ones so far um but now that we're getting to like some of the really good ones this is one of the strengths of the franchise is that it comments on on society so well um in this one the thing that stands out to me is um like they get uh they're here on earth you know present day or in the 70s and the way that we show these uh visitors our appreciation is by like taking them on fancy trips or like he said like the pretty woman stuff with the clothes and here try this fancy food it's like it's like is that really all we have to offer Richard's you plus. we can't yeah, exactly. We can't offer you like um, warmth and love and compassion, but we can offer you stuff, you know, like I'm it's surprised like, this was in the 80s. Yeah, I know. It's, but it's, like, it's a perfect commentary on on who we are as a society. And it's pretty, uh, pretty bleak. It doesn't feel like it when you're watching the movie at the first half until you get to the very mm -hmm. end of the movie, which like he said, I this is a bold choice that to me pays off. I was watching the movie and I was I, are we we're spoiling are we all of these yeah well except for i feel like why i was a little vague with kingdom because that one's brand new these okay. movies are decades old these, so these are like, 50 plus years old i feel yeah. like we've got some leniency here yeah so spoilers <clears throat> killing cornelius and zira seems to me like the only option when i was watching the movie i was like they're not going to do it. But like, if they really had the guts, they would follow through and kill Cornelius and Zero. And then they did it. And I was like, man, that ending was bleak. It was brutal. I was depressed. <laughs> I was like so sad when it happened. But I was, I think it's the right choice. I think this is a great movie. I think it's really well structured. Adam? Uh, again, really similar thoughts. I actually quite like this one as well, even though it's a bit down, further down in my rankings. It just kind of says a bit more about the other ones. Um, again, the time travel stuff, I was just, I, I was on board. I didn't care straight away. They they escaped C-3PO and R2-D2 style. They just got blown away from the planet. That's fine. Whatever. They got there. Um, again, that ending was really jarring. Like that was, that actually shook me and I, I, I look, I wasn't, I wasn't teary or weeping, but I was really kind of upset that they actually killed them. I was sh really shocked by that. But otherwise, this movie is... 70s as fuck like it's so 70s the soundtrack has got these hippie vibes um it's just the start and then that yeah that shopping montage was bizarre i was actually laughing through that because this is like i was just really out of place but also well in place i don't know it was a really really strange scene for me um I thought this one was really kind to the human outlook when we're talking about the mirroring of society. This was really kind to the human outlook because the humans sat and listened to them. Um, they spoke to them. They got to want to learn about where they came from. Nowadays, if two talking apes turned up from outer space in a time travel, they'd be shot and killed in half a second. We would be no, no prisoners, right? They'd just be done. Like That I found stretch my um, imagination a little bit more than anything else in a movie, in a series about apes taking over the planet. But, um, yeah, for what give that, yeah, for whatever that's worth. Uh, otherwise, yeah, I look, I, I did quite like this one. Um, definitely the worst of a good bunch, if that makes sense. Ricardo Montalban. Yeah. It's just talking yeah. at the end. <laughs> yeah. Which I appreciate him coming back to the next one, which we'll get to in a minute. But this one was such an interesting choice. Yes, it made no sense. From what I understood, it was like the bomb ripped a, ripped a hole in space time or whatever, and then blah, 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 blah. blah. And they wound up in our present time. 
But I love the fact that this film focused on Cornelius and the Cornelius and Zira, and they have such great chemistry. McDowell Hunter, they're so great together, and I just enjoyed spending time with them. And yeah, this movie hits hard in 2024 because there's a lot of things where it's just like, yep, that's America for you. And sure, that that ending. I remember watching this for the first time. I literally spent one New Year's Eve one year when both my mom and my brother had other plans and they had no plans. And I'm just like, well, I'm going to watch all five Planet of the Apes movies. Um, and just sitting there like, wow, back-to-back -back movies. This is depressing. <laughs> um, which also, crazy to think that the one where the two apes get shot actually hit harder for me than, you know, all of Planet Earth blowing up. Um, but that says a lot about these two characters and how they set them up. And yeah, the pretty woman sequence, there's legitimately funny moments, but I think the third act of this movie certainly feels very 70s kind of filmmaking where it's just like, yeah, this is this is not going to end nicely. And this is actually a nice segue into Conquest of Planet of the Apes, which is our next one. So this is wrapping up the bottom half of our films which this one jumped up a little bit and actually just barely is below the fifth film which we'll get to next but adam what are your general thoughts on conquest um i don't have a lot of notes on this one but i do think this is the best one out of the original series outside of the original i think this is I actually really like this one um it, kind of reminded me a lot of a World War II film um, with um, the apes playing the Jews, trying to escape persecution and whatnot. Um, it's not as fun, but it's a bit more meaningful um, and dramatic um, in that respect. So it kind of held my attention a bit more. Um, again, detail-wise, I watch movies differently to the rest of you guys. I don't remember those type of details. When you guys talk about it, I'm going to remember it all, but I just I don't store that in my brain. Um, but I do remember really liking this one. How about you, Foster? I love this one, too. I mean, we're at that point where almost, almost all of these, there's one coming up that I'm not as high on as the rest of you, but otherwise you I sure love all You sure aren't, Foster. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, this is, I agree with Adam, this is my favorite of the original series outside of the original. Um, it reminds me of, like, 1984 is what, what I first thought of. Just a similar idea, I guess. Um, but I love the... I just love the vibe. This one really feels seventies to me. Like, like just the opening, like ten minutes when you're just like the shot, the gritty shots of the street, um, and this is where Roddy McDowell to me kicks it into high gear as Caesar, <coughs> um, not the Andy Circus Caesar, but the Caesar of this original series. Um, interestingly, playing his second character of the franchise, but I just love his performance here, especially the ending monologue that he gives um there's two cuts of the movie there was the theatrical and then there's this unrated cut i watched the unrated one which goes much darker um where he like orders the apes to kill that guy or like um it's like governor, show no right? mercy say that again it's the governor right he has him yeah, yeah, yeah i think so and um I uh, kind of liked the darker ending. Um, it's not maybe quite as pure to the character of Caesar as we would think of him in the Andy Circus trilogy, but I thought that that would have been a really interesting turn and would have made Battle a much more interesting movie than mm -hmm. it was um, had they gone the darker, the dark Caesar route. Um, but anyways, he's just incredible in that final monologue scene in whichever cut you watch. Um, I also just love him making inroads with the other apes. There's that one scene when he gets thrown in there and they uh, give him a banana and then he breaks the banana and shares it with the other apes. And it's like, you don't even need dialogue in order to communicate what's going mm -hmm. on there. It's so cool. And also it's a great precursor to rise of the planet of the apes, which we'll get to. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with pretty much everything. This is the highest of the original five outside of the original one for me personally. Uh, I think this one's awesome. I, I find it really interesting in the wake of, uh, of the social movement of the late sixties uh, for civil rights. And uh, you know, we'll touch on it more uh, probably when we get to the original film from, from 68, when the civil rights movement was really in the swing of things. Uh, but this franchise stands for a lot of things uh, thematically, allegorically, 
and so on. Uh, but one of the biggest ones is race. Uh, I think that's very clear. I don't even think we need to go into it in terms of how that correlates. I think it's very obvious and wears itself on its sleeve. But I found the the riots in this film to be very revealing um, after the civil rights movement, uh, the demonstrations that would go on, uh, how some of them turned violent. And it's almost been omnipresent and foreshadowing um, as we've still considered or not considered, continued uh, to have systemic problems in our world today. Um, you know, it. I mentioned in my review, it feels oddly prescient because it also looked like the L.A. riots of the early 90s after Rodney King. It looked like, you know, what we saw after George Floyd and these things that just keep continuing to happen every few decades because still nothing is done um, in our society about these systemic issues. And it's seeing this reflected in this film is a big part of why I this film resonated with me and why I liked it so much. And on top of that, uh, Foster, I couldn't agree more. I think Roddy McDowell is awesome here. Like, I think this is his best performance of the five films. I think he, he wasn't actually in one of them, right? He, I think uh, he's... He, he, I think in Beneath, it was only like flashback. It, it was like footage from the original. I don't think he's in uh, that one. Um, but the others that he's in as a main character, I think he is tremendous in this movie. Um, his performance is spectacular. So yeah, uh, this this movie works really well for me. I like a lot of what it's going for, and uh, think it's it's very good. Yeah, I I'm the one that kept this lower. Apparently, um, I think I need to rewatch this one because I don't know. This one didn't resonate mm -hmm. as much with me when I watched all of these originally, and I don't know if it like obviously this one was so visceral and intense. And what this captures, it's like, it's, you could criticize the naming conventions of all these movies, because I think a lot of people have a lot of feelings about the, like, the first three in the new trilogy, and it's like... Yeah, that's way worse they, than anything in this, in the original five. <laughs> which, like, <clears throat> this feels like more like a battle, <laughs> battle of Planet of the Apes does, because, like, and, like, is it really a song quest? But, semantics. But, like, this feels so much of its time in capturing the boiling up underneath the surface and i'm so glad that this was the film that really gave ryan mcdowell a chance to shine in this because he's really the franchise he's it's like charlton heston was in one movie and phoned it in for a paycheck for a second one for a couple of scenes like he's the one who's anchored this whole entire original series and this film has heavy emotional moments. Ricardo Montalban. Um, I really liked him in the in these movies. Um, and just this leading up to that speech at the end is just like this hits, and I really need to rethink my rankings. Um, but <laughs> what's crazy is the next one we have, which wound up being our number five, is the most all over the place in terms of rankings because like this ranged from like the eighth for some people to the third for some people and that is kingdom of the planet of the apes which is the newest one so obviously well we won't spoil this one because this is still fresh and you should go watch it um but heath what are your general thoughts on kingdom of the planet of the apes uh i love this movie i i will be revelatory and say that I was one of the three spot people. Uh, I think this movie is amazing. Uh, I frankly, maybe expectations had played a little bit into it because the Caesar trilogy had wrapped up, you know, with war and it had been so many years. Uh, war came out in 17, right? So yep. now we're talking seven years later, uh, an absence of film, and I was just like, I don't, you know, how is this going to work? I, I didn't have <laughs> high expectations, but this blew them out of the water. And then some, I love the, the tribal aspect of how we are now hundreds of years in the future post Caesar and apes have started to splinter off depending on where they are geographically in the world and what natural resources they have around them. Uh, they've started to develop their own subcultures within a larger ape community. Um, how, 
this leads to logic and knowledge and wisdom that is conflicting, especially as it correlates to the word of Caesar himself, which has gone so far as to be revered and loved and cherished almost at a religious level to used almost as a, a war rallying cry and, and a tool for fascist dictatorship, while also some people just don't even know it exists anymore. Um, and then seeing how Caesar's words are used and manipulated to great effect throughout this film. I, I loved the opening of this with the, the tribal element and the eagle uh, apes, I'll call them. I loved the like hero's journey element um, and seeing, uh, oh, what's what's the new ape's name? The main ape in this one. Noah. 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 Yeah. And seeing Noah's journey. Um, I, I hate having no Maurice <laughs> in this one. And I know uh, Foster will probably talk about Maurice much more. He shares my sentiment. Uh, but seeing Rocket here kind of taking Maurice's place was great. Rocket is like our Obi-Wan Kenobi like figure to to Noah the Luke Skywalker figure but at the same time how that turns out it was like so crushing to me and just like the great conflict at the end of it all I I thought thematically this worked I thought visual visually this was a spectacle I thought this was entertaining it was thematically deep it made me think it gave me uh stuff to ponder from science to religion to politics and it was also really action heavy and just gave me that spectacle. So I, I absolutely loved kingdom. Um, I will let foster crap all over it now. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be the sour <laughs> one. Um, I, no, I might need to rewatch it and I will rewatch it at some point. And then if I end up loving it, then, then I end up loving it. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, for me, it just felt like um, all the, deepness that other people seem to have seen in the movie feels more like in concept rather than in the execution of the movie for me where the the different factions that form and the way they interpret and misinterpret caesar's words to me in the movie as we see depicted felt surface level as i was watching it and most of what i found interesting was going on in my head as in like mm, i like these ideas that i'm seeing on screen and then in my head, I'm making them deeper than they actually are. And I felt like the movie could have gone further with it, particularly with the Raka character. But then they made a choice midway through the movie with his character that sort of nullified any attempt to to use his character as a counterpoint to the the villain, Proxima Caesar, right? Um, which I liked. So I liked a lot of things about the movie. I like the protagonist. I like I like our villain. I love Raka. Raka is great. I love the visuals, of course. So there's still a lot of great things about it. I had a fine time <clears> watching <throat> it. But um, yeah, I just like not. I'm going to put a really fine point on it. I just don't think it's as deep as other people are saying it is. That was my feeling when watching it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to second that. I think it is. I, I went and saw this yesterday for um, because I didn't think I was going to get a chance for this podcast, but oh, it's not a podcast, shut up. I went and watched it yesterday, so it's kind of fresh in my mind, and I do think a lot of it is surface level. Um, and it, there was a lot of logic issues for me, and, and it's leading me to the point where I think, is there something I missed? Because I was sitting in my chair, it was, I was in like the, because it's such a, it's been out for a while, I was in the cheaper cinema with really uncomfortable chairs, um, so I don't know whether it was something I wasn't focusing on or my just my natural anxiety sitting in this dark room with other people around me and I just wasn't focusing on certain things that I might have missed certain character elements or explanations or exposition. Um, but a lot of the logic was left out for me, um, mainly in the name of May, like her skill set. Like I don't know, we we're talking about another movie before where the humans can talk uh, with the, the Tim Burton one. In this one, all of a sudden, the humans are talking. It's, 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 but this disease was supposed to have devolved humans where they can't talk, and it's, but everyone, every human can talk. And there's a lot of good stuff here. Uh, my, my thoughts are really scrambled, sorry. But there's a lot of good stuff here, especially towards the end, that lead to what the next in this, this series might be, um, especially around the May character collecting goodies for people in 
I'm spoiling, I guess, but people in silos. Um, what what Heath and Foster were talking about with the um, the factions um, being born out of these the apes in different different locations and the gangs, I guess, that they've made. Um, to me, that's just kind of like early anthropological studies. They're just kind of mir mirroring that aspect of how society does evolve when it's new and fresh. And the whole Caesar thing is a very religiously pointed concept. Um, obviously, words are taken out of control. If you look at the words of Jesus, and I'm putting that in quotes um, in this visual podcast <laughs> medium, um, in that Jesus's original words were like all for humanity, but they've been taken out of hand and used to abuse and, and destroy. And that's what's happening with Caesar. So it's very, if we're looking at, say, um, may, maybe this point in this section of Kingdom of Planet of the Apes is maybe edging up on medieval times. And maybe the next movie we get in this will be like a mirroring of medieval times where there is an actual kingdom, there are courts, there are, maybe that's where this is going. I didn't. I, I do did like this movie, but I think I like where it's going to head more than what it actually is. Obviously, I think there's a lot of potential to build on this. Yeah, obviously this is the freshest film. So, and we don't know where it goes. I think the benefit of all the other films is we know where they went. For this one, I'm definitely more on the Heath side of things because I really, really love this movie. Not as much, obviously, as some of the other ones that we're going to be talking about. Um, Robert was actually the one who had this lowest. Um, he had it like eight um, out of ten. So Robert's not here to um, share his thoughts. But I loved that this felt like an adventure. Because none of the other Planet of the Apes movies do that. Like, this is the only one that feels like it's a legitimate adventure that I feel like we're going on. And I love that about the film. And I loved Noah. I think Owen Teague did a great job. And I appreciate the journey that he has to go on, where he is meeting different apes at different times, because he's isolated. He's grown up in this one place with this one idea of the world, and now he's forced to confront all these truths that he didn't realize were a thing, as in, like, humans um and also this i these different differing ideas of who this caesar person is and i love raka he's one of my favorite characters and in, in any of these movies now like automatically bam loved it um proxima caesar it made me so happy seeing kevin duran getting to do something like meaty and fun it's also crazy watching him do videos and interviews where he's acting like boxers, which also it's just a fun thing watching all these uh, actors acting like apes. It's hilarious. Go to ape school. Um, It's thrilling. It's exciting. I was I really enjoyed the world building. I was impressed by what Wes Ball did with this because I was not I was not excited when they announced this movie because I love, love Matt Reeves in the last two films so much. I'm like it's not going to be the same, but it's not. They're, it's not as dynamic in terms of its direction as the last two films in this franchise, but it's still, the special effects look incredible. And just seeing this world the way it is, I am I'm not the biggest fan of where it seems like they're going with humans in this, because I was very excited for more focus on not humans being part of this world, and it looks like they're opening up a can of worms with that. And I'm not going to make judgments on films that we haven't seen yet, so it'll be interesting to see where they go with that. But this one obviously was the most divisive of all these films for us. And I don't know if that's because it's the freshest or, you know, it's just that kind of experience. A lot of people have a lot of differing opinions on this one, but find it very interesting. To, to follow up on that real quick, I... I think it's a combination of it is so fresh, but also, like you said earlier, we don't know where this is going. You know, we're also, you know, Adam's like, I'm hopeful for where this could go. I, I don't know how much I like this one, though. And, you know, you and I like this one, but Foster's more hesitant. You know, it's it's kind of one of those things where all the others 
those stories are concluded. You know, we, we know exactly the beginnings, middles and ends of all those characters and whatnot. And this one is still left hanging out there uh, in the void. So, you know, we might come to, you know, a, a good, a good analogy would be a lot of people weren't sure of empire strikes back when empire strikes back came out. In fact, a lot of people didn't mm-hmm. like it, but then, mm-hmm. you know, audiences mm-hmm. got return of the Jedi and that completely recon recontextualized the original star Wars trilogy. And nowadays empire strikes back is considered a masterpiece. Now I'm not saying that's going to happen here. It could go either way. Maybe we'll end up hating this. Um, but I do think that is interesting and worth mentioning. Um, and there was one other thing I wanted to say. Whew. Now I'm going to forget it, of course, because I'm really skilled like that at words and knowledge. Um, but yeah, I, I just really enjoyed this one. I, I am excited for where this. Oh, I remember now. Uh, I'm excited for where this is going to go. And I actually uh, do uh, get excited about the fact that humans are still around. So Adam, to answer your question a little bit, the exposition that you might have missed, I don't know, was that while some of the humans were immune to the original virus that plagued people in the original Caesar trilogy, most of those eventually did get the secondary effect of devolving humans, losing speech pattern, stuff like that. But there was even a subset of those that were still immune to even that secondary effect. And May right. was part of that. Um, and Shane, what I would say is I'm excited that we're going to still have humans because frankly, <clears throat> I don't think this franchise works without humans. No, I, I, I think we conflict. absolutely need the, the human ape dynamic at all times because it is that juxtaposition it is that contrast that allows us to have a mirror up to society and to tell these complex thematic stories. Uh, in fact, I, I even saw some people saying this one focuses so much on the humans uh, and it really takes away from the apes. I've seen some people say that, which frankly, a, I disagree. I think this is very clearly still an ape story in May is a passenger to that story. This is very much Noah's story, Raka's story, Proximus Caesar's story in May's, along for the ride and really doesn't have any agency until the third act at that. And even still the other, it's still the other people's story and we're seeing it from their perspective, but it's interesting that we mentioned earlier how the first two films, the original and then beneath those are human stories, but from then on from escape pretty much through until uh, discounting the, the Burton remake, because that again, is just a remake of the original, but from con- uh, escape, on they've all been ape storylines they've always had apes as the the lead characters as the protagonists and central figures so i'm actually kind of excited to see what they could do with humans in a more featured role and presence in the story i still want apes to be the focus because i think it's more interesting from their perspective but i definitely want humans to still be around because i seeing a story of apes being apes at that point that's no different than a story of humans being humans we need the juxtaposition of apes and humans together to show contrast and so i'm i'm excited for where it's going to go i'm still waiting for a godzilla movie without humans in it (laughs) i just want to see monsters that 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 i would say is different because Godzilla doesn't talk. <laughs> Godzilla just he smash. That's what he do. <laughs> Whereas the apes in this are intelligent. He lights up. It's I think I see, uh, where, I see just, where you're coming from, but I feel like you could still do so many interesting things with the different factions of apes and the different species of apes. Because that's what's so interesting about the original series of the play of the apes was how they factioned off. And the class system that was created. But we'll see. Uh, Moving along, though. So we have number seven, which is Rise of the Planet of the Apes. So the one that restarted the seven. You mean number four? Sorry. Yep. Well, the seventh one we talked about, number four, Rise of the Planet of the Apes. (laughs) So, Adam, what are your thoughts on Rise? Um, uh, It's ranked number four. Four is that right? Okay, I've I've got it ranked at number three. Um, again, I rewatched this recently. I haven't watched it since the last time I'd seen it. Um, if that helps anyone, um, I actually really like. I, I really like this. I I think it's a really clever way.
humans will be the downfall of ourselves. And I think, oh, what happened there? Um, Lost Adam a bit. Um, <laughs> it, it, the yeah, video sorry, just cut just, out for a couple seconds. You're back. Yeah, now. I just got a message saying recording in progress. Sorry, I don't know what you heard and what you didn't hear. Um, I'll, I would I'll, just I'll restart anyway. over because I don't, yes. I think we missed most of it, unfortunately. Uh, for real? Okay. Um, all right, I was on a roll too. Um, I really like that. So I put this week number three. <laughs> and it's unusual for me to be on a roll. I'm gibbering mess most of the time. Um, yeah, I really like this. I thought it was a really clever way to. Um, um, I've really lost train of thought now. Uh, it's a really clever way. <laughs> Very it's clever. Clever. The look on your face is really <laughs> off putting. It's really like, what the hell? Uh, <laughs> it's, it was a really good way to. Um, Show how apes will take over the planet and basically mirroring uh, society and how humans will be the downfall of ourselves. Um, I think the writing's on the wall with that type of thing. And it's a, basically, this is a, a human mistake. Um, and but basically because of corporate greed, corporate irresponsibility, um, that kind of resonates with me and it feels like it, it's a very valid way that this could actually happen. Um, for me... Yeah, this this was a really great restart to this series. Andy Circus is just crazy good, man. Like it's just ridiculous that we need to start giving Oscars to mocap performances and, and whatnot. Um, the James Franco of it is fine. I'm a big fan of John Lithgow. Love John Lithgow. Whatever he does, um, again, James Franco is a bit on the nose nowadays, and probably rightly so. But I think he's God, he has moments of being very soap soap opera like in this i think i don't think he's as good as what a lot of people think he is but he has moments of being really good as well um i am really rambling right now because i've just lost touch with what's happened um i'll hand it over to you fluster um i really like this movie i think it's a lot of fun i just don't think it's as good as the matt reeves ones which is why it doesn't rank as high for me um so i am the reason probably this one was a little bit lower weirdly i think i have it at number six which doesn't mean that i dislike it at all it just means that i really 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 like a lot of the other sequels um like conquest and escape are ones that i really love more than everybody else it seems um i agreed on andy circus he's amazing um james franco is like fine for me um i think yeah good and good in moments and other moments i'm like might have preferred someone else Agreed on John Lithgow, though. Uh, he's someone I definitely would have shouted out. I think for me, it's like the last half hour of this is like lights out, awesome, yeah. top tier genre mm. filmmaking, like just awesome. Like it's one of the coolest like third acts of a movie like ever. Um, everything up to that, I think is solid, like decent. I'm enjoying myself. I think the moment it shifts from being about James Franco to being about Caesar I think is the moment that the movie like, mm -hmm. kicks into high gear. Um, and again, I, I'm realizing I actually said the same thing with Escape. I feel like the best decision this movie made was switching the protagonist to be about the apes. And I, it's like, I don't know, they're just the most interesting parts of the movies. And um, I think the one thing that does hold this back for me is pretty thin supporting characters. Aside from Maurice, the greatest character of all time, um, where is his Oscar? And I'm not talking about the actor. I'm talking about Maurice the Ape. Where is his Oscar? <laughs> and um, I think like Tom Felton is really just like he's just like he's Draco, Draco Malfoy. Malfoy again mm -hmm. with a bad American accent who just for some reason has a grudge on a bunch of apes. And it's like you're an adult man. It's like what's your deal? <laughs> and then I don't know. There's just, yeah. there's yeah, aside from John Lithgow again, who's great. Yeah, I'll. I love this movie. I do think it is the weakest of the Caesar trilogy. Um, so I was probably one of the ones holding this back as well. Um, although again, I want to stress that I still love this. Uh, to continue foster with what you're saying, yeah, the not that I need like an antagonist. There doesn't need to be a villain. You can just have thematic or moral complexity that makes you know characters at odds. But when you are going to do a villain, which this film clearly does, it institutes some villain characters, whether that's, you know, the the corporate CEO who wants to, 
you know, go as full capitalism as he can to make as much money and exploit the system or this neighbor who's just the biggest dickhead ever, this awful, <laughs> awful neighbor of John Lithgow's or like uh, Foster, you said uh, Draco Malfoy or Brian Cox as well. They're just like, we're going to be bad to be like, they're like Stephen King bullies. Like we're bad and we want to mm. freaking murder you be because just because the reason is because because movie has to happen and stuff like that just drives me nuts so i'm like there's just no depth or understanding of why these they just are clearly here to be antagonistic and it's just it's not interesting to me but the other part of that actually holds this one back for me is this is incredibly rushed i'm not the kind of person who's normally like yeah a movie could use more runtime i'm usually one of those people that's like yeah we could have cut 15 20 minutes from x y or z film uh, but I feel the reverse on this one. This movie is barely an hour and 40 minutes long. It's with credits. It's just over that. This could have used a two hour cut. Uh, those first two acts before we get to the, as Foster correctly uh, stated, the most amazing third act, like those first two acts are so rushed of, okay, we have to set up Franco and he's doing the research and then, but it's the mom he's researching on the mom, but then the mom goes crazy and, the mom has to be put down and, but then the, he has the the son and it's Caesar and he takes him home and he starts, but then he's taking care of his dad and he's researching the Alzheimer's, but then, but then he has a relationship and we have to follow the relationship of this, this girl that he wants to date. But then we're going back to Caesar and Caesar's lonely and, and like, it's doing so much so fast that it seems to be skipping over. Not that it's skipping over putting them in the, in the film in terms of narrative plot development, but it's skipping over the breath that those plot points need to like resonate with our characters, to create stakes, to create emotion, emotional attachment from the audience. It just rattles things off so fast to get to the end game. The end game being the apes rising up. Um, and again, I'm not even saying that this is a bad movie. I still think the first two acts are really interesting. I think the third act is way better, but the first two acts are still really interesting. But uh, I do think there are some weird pacing decisions and editing decisions that really shortchanged what could have been really great and some really one-dimensional lackluster antagonists that seem completely at odds with the depth that they're trying to give the other characters in this film Mustache no one mentioned david oyelowo <laughs> wait yeah david oyelowo was the corporate guy who just you know wants to make money and yep. just like him and like it, yeah, Tom Felton's just what the hell? And God, them using the original line from the first movie felt so bad. I hate yeah. that so much. But speaking of line, the no that hits. Yeah, that hits. And you're so just hard. like that was. That's one of the Do best guys... moments in any of these movies. Any of these movies. Did you guys did you guys pick up on one, in one of the original ones? I don't know; they've all blended together. But um, I, I think it might be the one where they're on the ranch. But she's talk. One of the characters is talking about the legend of Caesar, and he says how he said the first word, and someone said what was, it? and he said, and it was no. Like Caesar said no, and then they kind of pay homage to that in doing that in this film. I thought that I like those little touches. Like it feels yeah. you feels your part. You're mm -hmm. in on the joke. Like you're part of the. I don't know. Did you guys pick up on that? Those little bits. Yeah. It's yeah, all like, about the revolution. I think it's it's part of the reason why a lot of people still think that this new timeline is technically a prequel because they have <laughs> seeded so many things so thoroughly that, oh, they yeah. kind of mentioned stuff like that in the old films. So a lot of people still think this is a prequel when really it's not. It is a new timeline. It is a reboot. Well, it, <sighs> there have been enough contradictory things that, and, and the creators have outright stated like, like we see it very clearly the in the other films it was about nuclear holocaust and humans destroyed themselves by nuclear armageddon and in this <laughs> one we were trying to create an alzheimer's cure and it created a biological disease that wiped out humans and like that's the main difference but there's other ones as well this is a different timeline but yes they still honor the original films by seeding in those little moments that make it feel special and like the creators really care about the franchise as a whole which is great can I, can I just add on to when we were talking about Kingdom, something I forgot to talk about was my massive overriding thought throughout the first half of Kingdom 
was this was leading up to where Charlton Heston lands on the planet. Basics all leading up to where humans, because even in Rise, um, there's a new you see a brief newspaper headline where, or it might even be on the TV news thing where it says there's astronauts are lost in space. So they're kind of leading to that even from there. I don't know if you guys would have picked up on that too, I'm assuming. Um, but for Kingdom, and still we get to a certain point, I think where May starts talking, I kind of lost that, but it really just feels like it's leading up, like it is that prequel series. But if they're saying it's not, then I'm going to be interested to see where where it goes. I think they'll still Sorry get to, to that eventually because that, that, that original film takes place 2,000 years after they take off whereas we're still only yeah. like 300 years by the time kingdom comes around so i think they'll eventually get there but they're, i think they want to tell a lot of other original stories before they rehash the class yeah, yeah. They, they're planning don't, don't out it. multiple trilogies still yeah. so they're going to go but my general thoughts on rise wish it wasn't james franco um the more i watch him just like he's kind of boring to be honest in this john lifko's great a lot of the human supporting characters are very bland this i also agree with that this is a very interesting way of introducing that this is how things happened and i think this is a fresh and interesting idea and also definitely hits in a different way in a post-covid world where yep that's interesting um, but no, Andy Circus is amazing. Caesar is such a great character. I also love Maurice so much. It's very interesting. They they uh took the orangutans back after they're a bunch of assholes in the original Planet of the Apes movies. Um, and making them some of the more likable ones and introducing Koba. Koba just mm. looks like bad news. <laughs> Start to just like Koba's gonna murder some people, and Koba does. And you now the third act of this movie is fantastic. And you know Matt Reeves just like the game. And also I'm much more about outside of the original film, the films focusing on the apes are much more interesting to me. And when Caesar becomes the main character, becomes a lot more interesting. But we have a tie for second place. So it's War for the Planet of the Apes and the original Planet of the Apes. Both have the Mm -hmm. same amount of votes. I'm going to start. Let's start with War because I, let's see, I was the only one that had War at number one. Because it's your show and you want to start with War. Uh, I actually had War at my number one. Um, Oh, really? Yes. Oh, wow. What are your thoughts on War for the Planet of the Apes? Who who did you say first? Heath. Okay. Um uh this is exactly where I had war. Um it's my next one. I I really enjoy war. Again, getting back to what we talked about earlier, the misnomer of these titles. Uh I don't I don't know how sh- the 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 first scene is very warlike and maybe the last scene is very warlike. I don't know if the rest of the movie is. Um but I do find this one very interesting. Uh, I think this is uh, very clearly to me the religious journey of Caesar um, as as a biblical, almost Jesus like figure. Um, we see him, uh, you know, crossing the country and picking up disciples and acolytes and followers and spreading the word, the, the gospel of Caesar, so to speak. Um, it, it's very interesting when we get to that point. Uh, you know, thematically in terms of how the narrative arc works, but then simultaneously this movie does this really fun stuff where it's like, oh, but now we're going to do literally the great escape and we're going to do a prison break, you know, (laughs) Uh, or stuff like that. And, and like I said, at the beginning, we also do get that epic war scene that uh, first opening act fight in the the forest is riveting. Um, So there's really cool stuff to hold your attention but I will say that what holds it back a little bit for me compared to uh, the two we have remaining is this second act journey. While I think thematically interesting, uh, narratively, it does it does drag a little bit for me. Um, it goes on a little bit too long uh, with without as much gripping growth as I would like. I, I think 
Caesar finds the growth he wants and Maurice finds the growth he wants relatively quick in that journey. And then it's just a matter of getting to the end destination. It's like the land before time where uh, Littlefoot and them are, are on their journey, uh, but they're growing all the way and they're learning more about themselves where Caesar already knows and we're just waiting for him to get to the end. Um, and when we do, it's also a little bit deflating because we finally get this big confrontation that we've been building up the whole film with Woody Harrelson because of the monstrous act that Woody Harrelson did at the beginning of the film and killing members of Caesar's family and him winning retribution and revenge. And by the end, Woody is succumbing to the second stage of this disease where even if some of the survivors are still alive, they're now, as we discussed, they're losing the ability to speak. They're devolving and becoming less intelligent. So it just, it just doesn't have the, the comeuppance that I think you'd want from an audience perspective. I still think Caesar's choices there are probably the right ones. And I think thematically fit and all that. Uh, I just, it's not as satisfying maybe as it could be, uh, but there's still some really great stuff going on. We still have Maurice at the end uh, championing the word of Caesar promising to, you know, help everyone is it really is land before time <laughs> when they get to the great valley at the end of the movie um but uh yeah i i think this is really good again the visual effects are spectacular these performances are really good uh, a lot of great stuff here war is a terrific film oster i love this one this is my number two um i this one's so interesting because a lot of the I, I think some of the same criticisms I hear for both War and Kingdom, but from different camps of people, which is about the movie's slow pace. And for me, I find Kingdom to be a slow paced movie in a way that doesn't really work for me most of the time. And then I hear other people say the same thing about War, and I'm like, but I love the slow pace of War. That one, I feel like is moving and profound. And like Keith was talking about with the sort of biblical journey of Caesar, I am so in it. Um, I I absolutely love the the pace of war and I love the the way it's shot and I think Matt Reeves is the best thing to happen to this franchise along with Andy Andy Circus. Um uh you know what if I had to pick, I think Matt Reeves is the best thing to to happen to this franchise. I think I think his work is incredible. Um I think Maurice really unironically gets a gets a standout role in this one. I also think that Silverback Gorilla that is at um Woody Harrelson's camp donkey? is donkey. Yeah. Donkey. That's right. Um, really is a, a an inter interesting character and has a nice little arc in there as well. Um, I just, I really, like I said, I'm on board with the biblical journey of Caesar. And that's also part of why going back to kingdom, that one disappointed me a little bit because I wanted it to lean more into that than it did. Like I wish Noah had a history um, with hearing things about Caesar when in the movie, it seems like he really didn't know much about Caesar at all. And I felt like it would have been more interesting to have our protagonists characters or our, sorry, our protagonists perception of Caesar challenged in some interesting way, which I don't feel like I got. Cause it's like, he didn't know Caesar. I'm going back to kingdom now. I'm sorry. Um, it's now, now it's now at that point in the night where it's very late for me, but um, anyways, war is the groundwork for what I love so much about what the series is going forward to do in kingdom. Adam. Um, this is one I definitely need to rewatch. Cause I had this ring says, I think it's the worst of the new of the Caesar trilogy. Um, but I think I'll watch this one. I really wasn't in the mood to watch it. Um, I watched it because it was like sport watching films just to watch them. Um, I kind of remember just not, caring so much about what was happening uh but well, i guess for me what triggered with me though i guess my most profound thought of this entire series is that where the original series is more about mirroring an entire society the entire human race and what's going on sociologically this series really is about how the decisions of one person can change the future how it can impact have such a broad impact on everything that happens. Um, I guess with, with Raj, you have James Franco going rogue with his um, drug research. Um, with this one, you have Woody Harrison making that choice to kill Caesar's child at the beginning. Um, and I guess we'll speak about uh, Dawn, what what that one choice was when we get to speak about Dawn. Um, 
because I can't remember off the top of my head. But that's basically as profound as I get with War. I, I do need to watch it again. Um, I was only recently I watched it, but yeah, I wasn't I wasn't in the right place or frame of mind to concentrate. But yeah, I just kind of vaguely remember thinking it's it's good. Like I did like it, but the consequences. I, I wasn't invested in, in the consequences of, of everything. So, like I said before, this is my favorite film out of all these <laughs> films. And I think just from a filmmaking standpoint, there's no comparison for what Matt Reeves does compared to literally every single other director that has touched these films. And the direction, the cinematography... It's incredible. There's moments in this film that are just jaw-dropping. And this film is gorgeous. And there's so many great characters in this. Woody Harrelson is such a bastard. And, like, the the decision to see what he did to Caesar is so effed up. And I remember sitting in the theater just being like, felt like my heart was ripped out. And you feel so invested in that journey. And the journey that Caesar goes on here, and maybe me, like Batty, who, who would have thought that Steve Zahn, of all people, would get his career revitalized by play the I will movies. stand for no Steve Zahn slander. That man is a treasure. Same. No, I the love stuff Steve that. From this on, what he's been doing is so great, whether it's like Righteous Gemstones or any of the other things. Like, um, but uh, Leroy Texas that he just was in, it, he's so good in this. And Maurice and Donkey, there's so many great characters in this. The action's intense. And this whole entire prison experience that thrown into this oppression and finally breaking free from human interference and in them growing as a species and making this really a planet of the apes and that final moment is so cathartic to this whole entire trilogy of caesar and just god uh, that hit so hard watching him pass away at the end of this film which also wonderful callback in kingdom starting off with his funeral i think was such a great choice at the beginning of that film like this there are so many feelings watching this film and this just feels like an incredible epic and this is such a great way for matt reeves to wrap up this trilogy and i was perfectly happy if they didn't make any more after it um but you know we're getting more apparently six including the one that just came out, if it keeps making money. So we'll have to see. Now, the other one that those tied with was the original Planet of the Apes. And Adam, do you want to go first for this one? Sure. I'm just making sure I was off mute. Um, yeah, man, this movie's fantastic. Um, just, uh, why is it so... Oh, this is actually ranked my number one because we don't... I'm a big proponent of... The original has, if it's a, especially if it's good, we wouldn't have the rest without this one. So that's why I I really like this, and I rewatched it recently. I remember my mum made me watch it when I was really young, and I have no I had no concept of what anything was about. Um, but rewatching this recently, I'm s still surprised at how well it stands up. Like it's it's just a really great study of humanity. We keep I keep saying, and we keep saying this mirror to society stuff, but it's just really well, it's a really well made film. Like everything about it where from 1968 with these costumes and everything is just really, um, production values are really high. Like there's, there's nothing lazy about it. Um, it's, it's, it's made to be a good film. It's not where it could have re easily been one of those B films where it, back in those days where it's just kind of something for people to go watch on a Saturday afternoon to get out of the weather. They really put a lot of effort into it to make it important. And it, and it is important. Like it, like it's, it's led to everything. It's led to people like us having no lives on a Friday night to, to go and rank an entire series of them. So, you know, it's, it's just, it's just great in so many ways. Um, Charlton Heston, so great. Um, Nova was 
sexy as hell, and that was great watching her. The whole, but the whole humans in cages are being experimented on stuff. It's it's it really does. It was just a role reversal, and I I loved every everything about this one. To be honest, Foster. This is yet another one where I love the slow pace. Uh, the thing that surprised me watching this for the first time just a couple months ago was how slow the first half of the movie was, and I didn't hate it. I really loved it. I thought it was beautifully shot. Um, Charlton Heston, again, is insane. He makes the weirdest facial expressions, but they work 100%. Um, every line delivery is he reads them as if it's the last line he's ever going to give. <laughs> um, I I just think, I mean, he's a perfect lead for the movie. Um, but I, especially cor- once we get to Cornelius and Zira, of course, those are, those are the true MVPs of the, of the original series for me. But um, I think what's so good about the plot of the movie is it's frustrating. Like you're watching the movie and you are frustrated for him. You're so invested and want him to be able to express like, no, I am a human and I am smart and I know things, you know, like you're just like so in it with him the whole time. And I think the movie does such a great job of putting you in his shoes. Um, Yeah. And then, of course, the ending is fun. Yeah, I absolutely concur about the slow burn nature of it. I think I I clocked the runtime on this recent walk uh, watch where I don't even think they find the ape village and where they start getting like corralled and hunted until the 30 minute mark. Mm -hmm. If I if I clocked it right, that first 30 minutes is literally just the three astronauts talking and like Mm -hmm. walking through a desolate Tatooine landscape like that's that's all it is is just the three of them talking and not even so much the three of them talking more like Charlton Heston talking and like insulting them and then just like you should really stop insulting me I'm gonna do something about it and then they don't um they're just like no you're not yeah <laughs> um, wouldn't it be wouldn't it be New Jersey where they've landed <laughs> uh yeah I, I presumably guess. something like that <laughs> um I I this movie is just incredible. It is before I go into the things I really love about this, uh, I want to say on a broader sense that I think that this franchise as a whole has been unfairly maligned to just be that stupid ape monkey movie franchise. Mm. I remember growing up as a millennial. So who knows, you know, how uh Gen Zers or maybe alphas are even gonna learn about this franchise. But like as a millennial, I remember people just making fun. Oh, it's the one with the goofy monkey masks. You know, like people made fun of this. In fact, to the point that when Rise came out, people were shocked, like genuinely shocked. They're like, oh, this is good. They made a good apes movie. Like because it had just kind of become culturally known in the zeitgeist that the original one was good and people liked it. But all the other ones sucked and people hating the the Burton remake. But like in going back and watching these, I cannot express and encourage people enough that they should go back and watch all 10 of these because yeah, we're ranking these and some things are going to end up at the bottom when you rank them. But like of the, there's only two of these movies that I don't really enjoy. Like the other eight movies are like average films at worst to, if not some of the all time great films. So I really want, just want to say that outright. Like, please people go watch these movies. They're tremendous going into specifically this one. Uh, Heston's monologues throughout this film are intoxicating, like just straight riveting. You can't peel yourself away from the screen. Uh, I think Jerry Goldsmith's score is spectacular. Um, I think the, the makeup and practical effects for the era were fantastic. Um, all of these societal and thematic th- uh, framework that it's going through uh, regarding race, uh, societal understanding, social equality, animal rights. Uh, that one's even one of the more obvious ones because he's literally put in the cage. Like we said, uh, like Foster said, and and uh, Adam said, that it, you know, this is this is us being put in his shoes, and we want to scream at the TV like, ah, come on, let it, you know. But really, what it is is it's holding a mirror up to ourselves as an audience and being like doesn't this suck for Charles? Mm. Doesn't this suck for him? Like, why does it suck? Oh man, that's, that makes me think about maybe we shouldn't be doing this to other people. And by people, I mean animals that we're just imprisoning and like 
how do they feel about this? Did we ever even give them that kind of thought? And to be talking about all these things in the 60s, a lot of these that are still issues that we are plagued with and dealing with today, this is one of the most brilliant thematic explorations of any film ever. And to be handled in such a nuanced sci-fi world where the world building itself is like surpassed by almost nothing like the the depth that they put into the world building to create this and be like oh the chimpanzees are the scientists and like researchers and the orangutans are the the politicians and the keepers of the religious scrolls and the you know the gorillas are, are the military forces like they thought of everything and it all works and it's gripping you know even like the the trial the tribunal session that he goes and he has to kind of plead for his innocence and and argue about how he knows about these things. It's just, it's it's a thematically rich film. It's well performed. The production values are crazy good for the time. It's well directed. The slow burn pacing makes everything feel more rich and evocative. Like, I love this movie. It is fantastic. And Adam, as you said it is crazy how good it holds up and it is still very rewatchable today. You could throw this on right now and just be like, Oh my God, this is so good. So yeah, everything about this movie is, is terrific. So Charlton Heston's my favorite actor and he just eats this film up and <laughs> not even just Charlton Heston, but Taylor, I really think is the most interesting human character in any of these movies. This is a man who has been burned by the world, had seen the world burn metaphorically at that point, and just being so frustrated with humanity. And that's exactly it. The first 30 minutes of this movie is him just being like, oh, you stupid humans that think that, you know, things were good. It's just like, it's terrible. <laughs> just... Is cackling and everything. Taylor is such an asshole, but he's so interesting and he's not wrong. And especially at this time, this was height of Cold War. And he's like, we're putting ourselves on the brink of oblivion. And I was so glad to get the hell out of here. And that's why the ending is so cathartic. And, you maniacs! And just the, him just completely committing to that. And at the end of the movie, which also has some great, up. just has so many great references and things. They reference that so many times in Archer. Um, big fan of that show. This movie is so influential. They had a musical in The Simpsons. Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas. Um, and just the whole cast yes. here. <laughs> Roddy McDowell, Kim Hunter. Uh, Maurice Evans is Dr. Zayas. Dr. Zayas is one of the most interesting characters in any of these movies. And I wonder why you shouldn't have the religion and the politicians be the same thing. That's not relevant today at all. This movie is, I recently rewatched this, just like this movie is way too close to home in 2024. And that's really sad. This was a this was counterculture era of shifting in society. And the fact that this is still so biting and real today is a shame in terms of human advancement. Maybe Taylor was right. Yeah. Also, fun on the fact, one hand, it feels like we've grown a lot. And then on the other hand, you watch this and you're like, oh my God, we suck. We've we haven't changed at all. Yeah. Which uh, apparently Edward G. Robinson was the number one choice to be Dr. Zayas and literally told Chuck Hens uh, Heston that Chuck, this makeup will kill me uh, and decided not to do the movie, which is why he wound up doing Soylent Green um, with Charlton Heston later. Yeah. Um, but just the cast, James Whitmore too, Brooks from Shawshank Redemption was sure. the one that led this tribunal which that scene, oh my god is infuriating and it's because i have these arguments with people today <laughs> just like the kinds of things that it's so poignant and yeah that score in this is otherworldly and so creepy and weird and so perfect i loved how they had bits of it in kingdom of the planet of the apes but for the sake of time let's get to number one which 
easily was ranked number one score wise with an average of a 9.6 out of 10. So almost Damn. completely there's Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. So Heath, let's wrap this one up. So what are your thoughts on Dawn? I just want to say that I love these rankings. They are exactly my ranking, except for Kingdom, which shifted slightly. Other than that, I nailed this, so good on me. Uh, no, Dawn is Dawn is amazing. Uh, this is my favorite film. This was my number one with a bullet. I think this is an absolute masterpiece. Um, this is the... If you looked up in the dictionary, if they had, like, what's the best like thematically rich movie you could make that's also a popcorn action flick, that's like wildly entertaining. This should be the picture next to it for all time. This is one of the most explorative, interesting, engaging films that I've ever seen about humankind, uh, what our social uh, predilections are and uh, the habits that we instill, how we approach different scenarios and situations and how we communicate or fail to communicate uh, our needs and wants and how we can have a healthy relationship while also being like, we're going to have some of the dopest action scenes you've ever seen. Popcorn is going to be flying because we're going to mount a, a fixed camera on this uh, turret head of a tank and we're going to spin it around 360 degrees and we're going to do the one of the coolest, sickest wonders you've ever seen of your life. And we're going to have an assault of all these uh, apes riding on horseback down Main Street of San Francisco, and we're gonna Ooh, blow up skyscrapers, and we're just gonna have apes swinging through the forest, like chasing people down, and just all this cool stuff. And all the while this is happening, where you're just like narratively enraptured, thematically, you're engaged and you're emotionally stirred, and you're like being entertained from a popcorn angle, you're still getting Matt Reeves, like owning just directing the hell out of this film with like compelling choices again i mentioned that tank shot that's probably the most obvious but just like really brisk unique decisions how he lights and frames the the ape village and their like tree houses or or how we see the the ruins of san francisco um and these performances andy circus i know we've mentioned it before but th this is the height and it, it can't go without stressing Andy Serkis, you are incredible. If they ever do a motion capture Oscar, which they should, it will because be because of you. Because of the Lord of the Rings, because of King Kong, and because of these movies, you are the reason we will one day hopefully get that Oscar, that voiceover or motion caption Oscar. And I hope they give you that Lifetime Achievement Award Oscar at some point because you deserve it. You have changed the industry. Like, flat out, you have. Everything that you're doing in here is more emotionally stirring and gripping than most Oscar nominees put out on any given year. Like, fantastic work. Um, Gary Oldman, you're not even in this movie much, but when you are in this, you're absolutely crushing it. When he finally gets power back and can, like, boot up his iPad to see pictures of his family, that is soul-crushing. Um, uh, Toby Kebbell, who is Koba, uh, again, perfectly seated in Rise and how he turns just to full murderous disaster. And this one, e excellent execution on this character, his, his performance, his mannerisms. And he's also one of these interesting villains where he's kind of right in some ways. And that's what mm -hmm. makes him such a good villain. Again, his execution and how he wants to go about things, terribly horrible. But like his his predisposition of humans are a problem. They will never fully accept us. They will always want to control us. We need to fight for like it reminds me of the Professor X and Magneto uh, conundrum in X Men. In fact, Koba and uh, Caesar are very much that. Where Caesar's like, no, we can find humanity and peace between the mutants and the humans. And Magneto's like, uh, no, that will never work they will try to destroy us. So the only thing we have to do is to destroy them. That's literally Caesar and Koba in this movie. And it's just, oh, it's so gripping. Everything about this movie is awesome. I'm going to shut up so other people can talk about it. Cause otherwise I will literally go on for an hour. Foster talk words, do things. 
I got two things that I want to say about the movie, and then I'll pass it on. Number one, if I could pin down, this is my favorite as well, just to say, um, if I could pin down one reason why I think this is the best one, I was thinking as you were talking, my one reason would be Koba. I think he is the reason why this movie is set apart from the rest, um, because you have such a strong villain figure that you do understand um he said some of this already but he's such a perfect counterpoint um because he's not wrong completely it's just like the 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 things he's doing are wrong but like his point of view is completely valid based on his experiences which we saw in rise um and then you can totally understand why he'd be upset with caesar for trusting the humans because it's like why would you trust the humans you know it seems to keep causing problems I don't know. I just think that dynamic is perfect. The performance is awesome. My favorite scene of the movie is when Koba is pretend palling around with the like army guys and mm -hmm. then shoots them like chills. I'm getting like, I'm describing it. I'm getting goosebumps. Um, so anyways, that's thing number one, Koba. Thing number two, I'm going to try and explain this. Something that I love in movies. Um, like I talked about with war and with the stuff I do like of kingdom. There's something that happens very rarely in movies. Dune has it. Lord of the Rings has it. This has it in moments where you get like a, a story of biblical proportions in the sense that in universe of the film, you feel that you are seeing history being made. Um, it's something that can like only really happen in genre movies like this, where you can feel like 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 obviously Caesar's the Jesus figure for, for these other apes, you know, in his life. And so like, when you see the opening shot of Dawn, the zoom in into like Caesar's eyes, goosebumps. I just think it's so cool. Um, yeah. It's just something that these movies tap into that. I really love. Adam. Man, I don't have a bugger all to add to that. Honestly, I was going to play a prank and say, well, I'm the one I rank this. This is a terrible movie, but, it's obviously not a terrible movie. Um, I guess the little bit I will add is that when I was talking before about this series is about the uh, in, one individual making a decision, and for me that was Cobra in this, as in deciding to go against Caesar and go off on his own and, and do what he does, which is right in his own head. Um, but again, what, what holds this entire trilogy up, the Caesar trilogy up so well is that that character development for all of them is it's logical it's not manufactured it's not they've jumped to this because movie reasons you can see that seeding from each movie to the next as to why they are why they become what they become and that's more than whatever matt reeves is doing behind the camera and what we see on the screen that's what gets you engaged as as a viewer to be invested in what you're watching because otherwise if you never didn't have that this is just talking apes on, on the screen, and, and it would be ridiculous. That's why we love, that's why movie lovers, I think, love movies is because of the characters that we can relate to and understand and invest in and want to see a resolution for them. And, and that's what these movies do best. Um, and 100% agree with everything Heath and Foster said, um, echo completely. The Cobra scene where he steals that machine gun as, as a just playing around with those guys. It's so great. The dolly shot in the tank, just, I, re, I when I watched this recently, I rewound it again and watched it again and watched it for a third time because it's just, it's such a simple thing, but it's so effective. Um, it's just, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a great film. I, rank, I had this rank number two, so I am the one that prevented this getting its perfect score of 10, but, that's just me being me and thinking this wouldn't exist without the original. And the original is just as good for me. So, yeah. Yeah. I also have this number two. So it's also why. Uh, and right. I realistically think the original play in the apes, Dawn and war on a whole other level. And it's just the fact that you could have a franchise with these three movies in it. It is incredible. And the two things I'm going to say piggybacking off of Foster talking about the opening shot and that 2001 a Space Odyssey-esque really creepy music playing as they're all swinging through the trees and stuff. So cool. And dual wielding machine guns on a damn horse jumping through flames. 
It's like the most. That is one of the coolest shots in the history of film. Whoever thought we would get a chimpanzee riding a horse, dual wielding machine guns, jumping through flames, this movie delivered that. So there you go. That's all I have to say to add to what you all said. But that is indeed a ranking of all 10 Planet of the Apes films. And if you haven't watched all these films, you should. Um, it's worth going through one of the so like surprisingly shocking, most impressive franchise in the history of film. Because most people don't bring this up when you think about longevity. But like this been going since 1968 obviously gaps but it's still accomplishing some amazing things but there's, there's a, a, oh, just, i was just gonna say there's a very common question on social media people say what's the best trilogy <laughs> pardon me this never gets mentioned it never gets mentioned i think the bizarre. caesar trilogy should get mentioned i don't know if they'll count as a trilogy anymore because <clears throat> i have a fourth one but you well, know it is what yeah, it is. He's not in it. But from Adam, Foster, and Heath, thank you all for coming on and chatting some apes with me. Thanks for having us. It's again. Anytime, my man. And thank all of you out there for always tuning in and supporting your Wasteland Reviewer.